Um, first panel session today, I'd just like to welcome uh, members of the panel. Uh, we have one person who hasn't been able to make it, um, but we certainly have uh, five people here. We have Michael Aubrey, uh, one from Victoria, uh, former uh, Darren Council CEO. Uh, John, sorry, uh, Carolyn Conrick, uh, Director of uh, Community Services. Yes, with uh, the Bayside City Council and our former council CEO. We have Ron Mack, uh, the uh, director of the financial audit with the Office of General Department of Victoria. Uh, John Watson, the panel chair of Brimbank Council and ex executive director of Local Government Victoria. Uh, and Kerry Ma, um, who's a local government consultant and a former uh, CEO of the City of Knox um, and is involved in a, a range of activities with the MAB. So uh, I'd like to thank the panel members very, very much for their time and support being part of the process today. Uh, Firstly, Anne Lewis, President of the Australian Labor Government uh, um, Association. Uh, and we'd like to start off by just going down the panel and um, uh, commenting on uh, this topic of uh, regulatory reforms and their role in um, the life of Labor Government. So I'll start off with Michael Aubrey and we'll start the panel. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thank you, John. And um, welcome. And thank you for having me here, ladies and gentlemen. I can see it's a big mixed audience uh, with councillors and uh, senior officers and even, dare I say, administrators, uh, which is really good. I want to touch uh, very briefly in a few opening comments on one aspect of the issues that have been raised here in the, the prop sheet today, and that is in the area of performance indicators and performance measurement. And in my view, um, I believe that we all uh, to make change, do have to work together in a cooperative way. I think um, I say that because the relationships that you encounter in local government are really complex relationships, or can be complex relationships. And I think reforms, especially such as this one around performance measurement, that uh, many of you would be aware of, that, that's bubbling along at the moment, significant reforms such as that can't occur in the absence of some level, high level of uh, unilateral cooperation, uh, unless a big stick is wielded, I guess. I do think back many years to the Kent reforms, the, the 20 years ago, two decades ago, I was in, involved right in the middle of all of that stuff at that time, around a, an accounting issue called WAS 27, bringing in commercial accounting principles into the local government space, and people were saying back there, look, it just doesn't work in local government, you can't operate that way. And yet, uh, two decades on, we'd say, well, how on earth did we ever have any useful information presented to us when it wasn't in this form? Those reforms were implemented and implemented successfully over that uh, journey because of the unilateral cooperation. Minister Hogg at the time was fantastic. Even Yudhi Glacier was good at that time and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and helped a lot. Um, and, and, and I think um, the senior officers and certainly councillors assisted remarkably. I believe the same thing will happen again in this area of performance measurement. In fact, I think councils actually want to see performance measurement occur. The problem has always been, oh, we're going to compare apples with oranges, it's too hard, we're going to get into the detail, it's not like for like, etc, etc. And this is where we need bold people, we need bold officers, we need bold councillors. You know, we want councillors particularly who are movers and shakers, not looters and takers. We want councillors who are really going to be on board. When I presented to the MAV board um, some months ago on this issue, um, I, I don't know why, but I was sort of surprised at the strength of positive support for the issue of introducing performance measurement. And the councillors there that represent uh, you were saying, here, yeah, bring it on. And, and do it as big and as, and, and as far wide-ranging as you can within the resources that are available. So I guess I'll just leave those opening comments there. There's plenty more I can say on that issue alone. Um, but I, I really do believe that um, we can reform ourselves and continually reform ourselves if we do it in a joint way. I should just uh, throw in another, another thing in that regard. It's not just around performance measurement and and compliance and so on and so forth. Local government has to keep finding new ways of doing things better and better. Um, community chef, our regional kitchen facility is a perfect example of that. That started with, after a whole lot of research, five CEOs sitting down together and saying, what are we going to do about this? And now we've got a $25 million state-of-the-art, world state-of-the-art facility in our town, servicing 22 councils across Victoria, with lots more to come. 
Thanks, Michael. Uh, Karen? Thanks, John. Um, I should have realised that you would talk about performance and vision and image reporting. I'm going to also make some brief comments on the subject. I don't think any, any of us around the room would think that there would be a business in place or a company, a public company reporting to shareholders that doesn't see business measurement or performance measurement and reporting as fundamental to its business. And it's no different in local government. Underpinning performance measurement and reporting are the principles of accountability, continuous improvement and value. And we're all struggling at the moment with the concept of public value and fund their fundamental principles to sustainability. So we all know how important performance measurement and reporting is. The work that Mick's doing at um, Local Government Victoria, I don't think we've seen such quality work done in years around this, this topic. And I would say that that's a, um, an example of the advice, the quality advice and assistance that Mick and Mark are providing to Amelia in this process. We've got an in into this process for the first time for a long time around this whole matter. So performance management and reporting for local government has to be the key to the way we connect with our community in the future. It's the relationship building piece. It's the piece that Phil Shanahan talks about. It's absolutely essential to how we provide, uh, justify our relevance into the future. It's the part of the conversation and the narrative that we need to have with our community. It's also the piece that the councils would need in place to enable them to, to have the opportunity to move more into the strategic space. With the organisation, I think it's the essential piece to get the alignment that Diane talked about from individual performance plans right through to community planning council plans. Thank you. Thanks, and on the, the generals produced a number of very uh, sort of relevant reports in the last four or five years about um, the performance of local government. Uh, what's, your, you know, what's your take on, uh, on performance today and also future directions? Um, in terms of performance today, I think um, everyone in this room will, will know that it hasn't been done very well. Um, in terms of from my office, we've been talking about what's been done and what's been reported and it is a very important piece of work that um, local government Victoria is currently doing, but also um, I would say that individual councils have to know and sort of get into this is because of how important it is. Because in the end, you are looking at, I suppose, after public money, public funds that's coming to you, and also there is a high level of demand for services and sort of on your sort of limited resources, but you have to perform. And it is one of the ways that you go back to the public and tell them what you've managed to do, what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. And in the end, it is about that and coming clean. Um, what I would like to add in then on top of just performance reporting, it is also fundamental in terms of good governance. As you know, in terms of good governance, I mean, what you have to look at is you have to look at being accountable, you have to look at transparency, and you have to look at... I'm afraid to say, some compliance in terms of legislation, what you need to do. And you've got to also look at being responsive to your ratepayers that are sort of supplying the funds to you. And you have to include them. And it has to be efficient. And so it is not an easy task. So there is a lot of things to look forward to or things that you have to look at in order to get the job done properly. So that is definitely an area that you sort of report back to the public and one of your forms of reporting back to the public in terms of the performance reporting stuff of what you've done, where you are at and where you're going. Thanks, Ron. And John, you're, you're just in a fairly unique position as, uh, as former Executive Director of Local Government Victoria and uh, Panel Chair now will bring that council to uh, comment on how effectively you think councils are um, looking at this area and you know, the potential for improvement in the future. Uh, thanks, John, and uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to be part of the panel this morning. Um, the comments that have been made so far, I mean, I, uh, I won't repeat them because I, I basically agree with them. So perhaps I might just touch on a couple of things and then leave for the discussion. Um, the legislation and, and regulation and the suggestion of uh, reform uh, reform will always be ongoing, of course, but uh, what we, I think, quite proudly have had in Victoria for many years is very much enabling legislation. 
Uh, if you look at the Local Government Act, you might say, oh, it tells us to do this, that and everything else, but it's actually quite enabling rather than uh, uh, overly prescriptive. The great risk for the sector, uh, if it uh, doesn't do things itself and doesn't do them well, is that governments will always be tempted to play with the Act. Um, and uh, it can happen by stealth. Uh, it'll change here, it'll change there. In the end, you, you end up being micromanaged uh, through <coughs> legislation and regulation. Do you want that? I, I'd seriously suggest that you don't. Um, the question of uh, behaviour is, is one of the topics uh, that's been listed for this panel. Um, and uh, as we were gathering before, I think we all agreed, um, bad behaviour or uh, disagreeable behaviour by councillors um, uh, has always been with the sector and no doubt will always be with it. Uh, I think the real question is what is bad behaviour? Uh, is it simply because you don't agree with somebody? If you're a councillor, it's your right to have a say and uh, it's your right to say it publicly if you don't agree. Uh, I don't think anybody in the room would uh, put up their hand and say, I would hope that you wouldn't, uh, that you haven't got that right as a councillor. Provided you're acting legally. If you're not acting legally, uh, that's the allegation, then that can be dealt with uh, through proper processes that are provided. But dealing with so-called bad behaviour uh, is an incredibly difficult subject. Uh, and if we do, do, do go down the path of further and further prescription in that area, uh, I, I think that it will be a very, very dark day for the government. Performance uh, uh, measures. Um, I've long held the view that the sector should embrace um, that performance measurement. Certainly should not be afraid of it. Uh, and I think the opportunity is now presented to have this this comprehensive uh, go at it. Uh, the sector should be putting out their hand and excitedly saying, yes, we want it uh, and we can do it. Uh, and don't, don't be afraid of the league table. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Terry? Thanks, John. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments uh, simply about performance management. Performance management and council sustainability is simply about sound business practice. And uh, I uh, took some stuff off the uh, MOB's website yesterday. And you're probably aware of this figure, but I'll just remind you of it. Local Government of Victoria spends $7.6 billion on capital works and recurrent services. $7.6 billion. And between councillors and officers, that's a huge spend on behalf of the Victorian community. So performance measurement and continuous improvement, which is the other aspect here, is simply sound business practice that most major public companies, most, I'm not saying all, uh, put in place sound business practice. No different in local government, it's about sound business practice. So you are the custodians for the Victorian community of $7.6 billion worth of spend. Uh, that's all I'll say on that one. Um, the legislation in relation to mandating the responsibilities between council and CEO, uh, there's a bit of history to that. I don't know whether there's a serious problem with that at the moment. Um, John mentioned the Act and Enabling Act. Um, if you start putting more prescription in, you go back to pre-1989 and you end up with a piece of legislation that's like that, which the old Act used to be, which micromanaged. And I think there's a way around that. Um, if it is an issue, and I work with a lot of councils, uh, the, the, the issue is the relationship between the uh, council CEO and the executive, uh, and um, and the mechanisms you put in place through policy, which are the building blocks. That's the foundation that you really need to have a look at. And I'm happy to take questions on that. The other issue which John touched on was the uh, councils behaving uh, badly. I've been in local government um, since 1963, uh, so there, yeah, long before a lot of you were born. Uh, I started as a boy uh, at the city of Melbourne. Uh, and ever since that time, Melbourne City Council had 33 councillors at that time, they've got nine now, and they were both behaving badly 50 years ago. So you won't get rid of that, but there are mechanisms in place, and I happen to be uh, on the uh, list B governance uh, list for the Council of Conduct Panels, I've been involved with them. And I'd much rather not be involved at all, 
uh, but the fact is, from time to time, they are necessary. Um, and is, is it the, the best way to go about it? The best way for this resolved in turn, if you can. Um, the other issue that's there today is about the council plan and the integration with other council plans. My experience as a CEO in three municipalities um, and working with other councils is that often councils just say we're doing it because the legislation says we have to do it. And it's not about that. And I recall uh, where the Minister had knocked back one council plan and I was asked to uh, retrospectively work with the council to fix it up, which I did. And the Mayor of the day said, well bloody hell, why are we doing this? And uh, he was a professional in that community and it just staggered me that he would say that. I said, forget the, the Act, the council plan is your legacy to your community. Forget the legislation, it's necessary. But work with your community to make sure it actually works. And look at all of your other plans that you have. I worked with another council that had 18 uh, different strategic plans and they're trying to work out how they integrate over a five year period with uh, the council plan. And 50% of them didn't integrate at all. Um, so there is a need to have a look at that more broadly and strategically as to how uh, you can integrate all of your plans. It's not easy because a lot of it is history and you then have to say, okay, well, how relevant is a plan that was done five years ago to what we're doing today? So I'll leave it at that and happy to take questions, John. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. And also the President of the RLGA, Councillor Fiscal and Lewis. Fiscal and you come from Mary in, in South Australia, but obviously in your current role uh, you'll be travelling around the country and looking at the, this question of reform and regulatory reform from a whole variety of different perspectives. I mean, what's your take on and where we are and also uh, whether this has a you know, much more, uh, I suppose, um, proposed need now than it has in the past, uh, looking at the, the challenges facing local government. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today um, and to speak to you for a few minutes. Um, yes, I have certainly had the privilege um, in the last 12 months to visit uh, every state and participate at their um, general meetings and, and conferences and uh, everybody is in a remarkably similar position. I guess that would come as no surprise to you. Western Australia, I was there about three weeks ago, their government has been looking at um, reform of the Metropolitan Councils for two years, left it with the sector and then decided the sector had, had long enough to chat about it and they stepped in and made some decisions about what they're going to do. And I think you might have had a similar history um, here in the past as well. So a whole lot of discussion around consolidation, amalgamation, um, you know, what are the, the strengths and limitations of those kinds of processes, but also the whole um, professionalisation um, of us as a sector. Um, it does always make me um, smile a little bit when I listen to state and federal government um, people talking about the fact that we have to be more accountable, more transparent. Um, we have to have things out in the public arena, we have, you know, liaise with our, our ratepayers. Um, and I think, well, where's the role modelling around that? Um, that shouldn't just be for local government, surely, if that's good governance practice, that should be happening at the state level and indeed at the federal level as well. And I'm not, I don't know about you, but I'm not overrun um, with seeing that um, coming out of government departments either. And therefore I suggest that there's a challenge not only for, for us as a sector of government, but for all levels of government in this area. I think local government is becoming, as I said, increasingly professionalised. We've got most of our CEOs now have degrees in business management um, practices and so on. I think the big challenge for us is probably not with the large metropolitan councils. It's in our small councils and coming from South Australia, um, we've got very small councils with thousands of kilometres and hectares of land and roads uh, to manage with the same governance expectations as the Brisbane City Council in some ways. Um, because it doesn't matter whether you've got 50 people or, you know, um, several million people to govern. The same kinds of things need to be done. But I, I think the challenge for us is often around the resourcing um, of that and uh, to be realistic about what it is that small entities can actually achieve. And I guess that might then throw back the question around amalgamation, but I think you need to look at the research that the Australian Centre for Excellence in Local Government has done on that. Um, amalgamation doesn't mean lower rates. People often think and hope that that will be the case. It's not. Read that paper and you'll actually see what the evidence suggests from a quite a large 
evidence-based literature, literature review of, of uh, amalgamations across New Zealand and Australia and other Western countries. So um, I do agree that we need to be more professional in our work around performance management. Um, indeed, my own council has um, even done two rounds of um, looking at our own performance as a, a corporate board, I guess, um, and uh, have worked with InSync to, to look at the things that we think we're doing well and where we need greater um, education um, and focused our training around those things that have come out of that review. And I think that's probably something at the, at the um, councillor level um, that we perhaps um, need to be focusing on a little bit more as well. Um, just a final comment about um, regulation, and that, if I can just for a few moments talk about the national view. Um, from an ALGA perspective, um, what we are seeing at the national level is that um, the focus has been on improving the regulatory role of councils as it relates to the areas of planning and development assessment, primarily, and the regulation of small business. Um, we've had two major Productivity Commission reports in recent years on these two areas and the Commission's conclusions make interesting reading and if you haven't had a chance or haven't read it for a while, go back and have a look. They make some good points about how councils can improve their own performance, um, but they make a number of other points as well. On planning and development assessment, the Commission concluded planning systems vary greatly between jurisdictions that all suffer from, and it comes back to the issue I think about enabling legislation, an objectives overload, which is increasing. Because if you don't get the policy right, what people jump in and do is actually put in more regulation to try and fix up problems. So you get to the point where you should just perhaps wipe it all out and start again and build it up with a whole root and branch um, review. There are significant differences, and I've mentioned this a little, in how capably um, state governments manage their relationships with and provide guidance for councils. I'll come back to that point again. The success of councils in delivering timely and consistent decisions is influenced by the regulatory environment that's created by our masters, the states, particularly the clarity of strategic city plans, the coherence of the planning laws we're asked to use, and then the subsequent regulations, and how well these guide the creation of our local level plans, and then the assessment um, of those development applications. Just in conclusion, on local government as a regulator, the Commission concluded that implementing and enforcing state government laws rather than local laws dominates local government's regulatory workload. We're actually doing their work, that's our role, and that was in many ways why we were created. Um, so often we get beaten up about a whole lot of that, but we've inherited that from acts that are made and then regulation that's given to us, often with no consultation or very little consultation for us to talk about how that could be done perhaps better than what we're often given. Um, there are important gaps um, in the support from, from the states, and, and that leaves local government having to cover um, insufficient consideration of local government's capacity, I mentioned that before, to administer and enforce regulation before a regulatory role is delegated to us, um, and then often limited guidance and training on how to administer and, enf and enforce those regulations. And also, um, unfortunately, no clear indication about the ranking of the priorities of these regulations. So it leaves local government often in a regulatory vacuum. So um, I, I raise those um, as issues that, that we're trying to advocate a, about at, at a national level um, on the COAG standing committees where we get an opportunity to, to sort of put those points for consideration. So again, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Jenkins. Just a quick one about COAG. Uh, it's, in your, it's in your role as sitting on the COAG uh, group. Um, uh, in terms of trying to get the uh, you know, red tape reduction program off the ground and with the other you know, sort of work uh, programs that COEX currently got on its table, is it, you know, what's your take on the attitudes towards local government and the involvement of local government in that discussion? Thank you. Um, yes, it was interesting. When uh, Prime Minister Gillard set up the business advisory uh, group, uh, which met twice at their first meeting, we local government didn't have a seat at the table. Um, but at their first meeting, we understand, because we weren't there, um, it became evident from the people around the table, and it was a massive group, 
that local government needed to be there because, as I've just explained, a lot of the regulation is up to us to enact. And so at the second meeting, we then received a letter, Alga, can you please come to the next meeting, which we did, and I represented you at that meeting and certainly uh, raised the issues that I've raised here, that um, we're often seen as the bad guy in all of this, but a lot of this is not of our making. Yeah, I admit some of it is, and I'm not saying we aren't in it, but certainly, um, I mean, this was one of Minister Gillard's uh, creations, so that potentially, you know, will not carry on with if it's Prime Minister Rudd or if we have Prime Minister Abbott. Uh, but uh, I think the federal government is very aware of it and certainly business have made them very aware that this is a problem for them, um, both big business and small home-based and, and medium-sized businesses as well. So we are at the table um, and I think it is somewhere that we need to be so that we can really try and address this to en enable and create an environment that enables business to be successful. Just before, just before we throw it open to the audience, just a quick question for the panel again. Uh, the, the sort of philosophy that you know, if local government really uh, embraces uh, the need to be more and more, you know, uh, of higher performing, if you like, and, and to embrace change and drive reform internally, uh, you know, it, is there a trade-off between that happening and the fact that, you know, if, if it did happen, there would be less uh, sort of imposed regulatory reform, whereas if it didn't happen, as you said, there is a a, uh, a tendency to sort of try and micromanage local government uh, by other levels of government. Just, just, a, just a question <coughs> from perhaps, uh, the panel. Michael? I think there's, there's always going to be continuing pressure coming down from state government to you know, flip the act around a bit add, chop, change, etc. And, um, and that's one of the dilemmas that we do we do face. I, I think the Act at large isn't too bad the way it is now. Certainly, um, it's, it's, I remember the 58 Act, and that, that was big volume, and that really micromanaged us. And we don't want to go back to that space at all. I think uh, the only way we can continue to sort of... Uh, Prove our bona fides, though, is to keep pushing the edge in terms of identifying new and better ways of doing our business. And I go back to the sort of shared services model as one of the opportunities that I think we've got to more fully embrace. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'm with John here in terms of the act about it's an enabling document. Um, even when I spoke before about local government Victoria and their performance measurement framework. I see that as the bones, the starting point, and that each council needs to put the meat on the, on the bones. So it's the movement that we can add to the structure, and I think the, the Act is there to add the movement. And it's about our performance and what we do with what's there in front of us and how we take that. And I have to keep going back to, you know, we just need to know our communities so much better than we know them today. We need to know exactly the value point that we can offer. We need to connect. So I keep going back to that. I think that if there is the ability to, to add to, add the meat on the bones, I think the act there enables <coughs> us and doesn't probably need too much um, change. <laughs> Ron? Um, I think that, I mean, I, I look at the act sort of provides you the minimum standard that you need. In a sense, it's one of those sort of things that you have to do your self-assessment in terms of where you want to head towards uh, and what is better practice and what you need to do. And I think with that and also looking at, I suppose, the strategic direction of where you are heading and sort of tying your strategy with what you currently have, I think the Act provides you with the bare minimum. So you are supposed to build on that, I agree with the other panellists, and then that's what you need to do and for you to move forward. So then making the act more prescriptive on what you need to do. So it provides you, I suppose, a, a platform to do what is necessary. And John, do you, do you, um, do you find that there was a degree of frustration at the state and federal government level about the performance of local government when these things were being considered? I think it's, uh, it's clear that there's been a growing uh, concern or frustration, however you might like to describe it, um, that uh, the sector 
has not been prepared to deal with uh, performance measurement properly. Uh, and here in Victoria, you know, we've had a number of uh, Auditor General's reports, um, and uh, in getting increasingly pointed, I guess, um, in pointing out the sector and saying, no, not good enough, you've got to do better. Um, in terms of legislation, I'll just go back to that. Um, the 58 Act, uh, which is the one for the 89 Act, I, grew, I cut my teeth on that. Terry started in 63, I started in 66. Um, and you have to know, you have to be able to quote it. It's a lot of years between us. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, the 89 Act um, was a breath of fresh air. Um, but it's probably close to half the size of the current Act. So over time, by stealth almost, you know, little bits get added in. Uh, I can take you to various parts of the Act and say that's the X Council Amendment, that's the Y Council Amendment, because something occurs and government of the day says we've got to do something about that and we'll stop the rest of them doing that or we'll fix that little loophole. Um, if the sector performs and gets on with the job and doesn't um, cause these concerns uh, at the next level, then the temptation to play with the legislation would be a little bit disrespectful, but um, shouldn't be there as, as much. There will always be change in legislation, uh, and that is inevitable, but I think we can, uh, can minimise it as a sector. Thanks, John. Uh, I think it's about a level of maturity of the local government sector. Um, and if I look around the state over the last 11 and a half years since I uh, finished C.R. Knox and became a consultant, I'm, I'm terribly encouraged by the, uh, the, commit, the level of commitment to adopting best practice. And uh, Ron referred to it, uh, you know, there, there are issues of uh, compliance. But there's a willingness. I'm working with some young CEOs at the moment who are so energetic um, about doing the best they can for their councils. And a lot of the drivers come from the CEO having uh, the skill set that really enables them to take the council down that path. Because in reality, if you have a look across the 631 councillors plus three administrators of Brimbank, um, you're a microcosm of the wider community and, and won't necessarily have all of the skills necessary, but it's a little understanding of that and having a skilled uh, CEO that's able to take you down a path of best practice, whether it's... Uh, and it, it's all about the community at the end of the day, isn't it? Um, why are we all here today? Not because we want to be at the Sovertel, but we've got, because we've got these communities out there that rely very heavily on us for support through services and infrastructure, the $7.3 billion I referred to before. So, so that, that's part of the, the equation. And it's the, having the credibility uh, with the state government in particular. Um, that, that will always, there will always be a tension because state government as a total entity is far more powerful than the state if you think about it in terms of what it does. Um, legislatively, because we're creatures of the, the Local Government Act and it's a state act of parliament, they can get rid of us tomorrow. Um, in 1994, 95, uh, as most of us would know, uh, the 210 councils went down to 79, 78, now to 79. Um, so it's having that credibility and building that relationship through the MAV, through ILGA, um, at, a, at a national level, uh, and with uh, VLGA as well, um, and also LG Pro. Um, having that credibility and relationship and saying, okay, we don't need, necessarily need more regulation if we perform the tasks that we're supposed to and we measure those. So there's probably a balance between uh, regulatory requirements and self-regulation and some of those elements can be done through, as I said earlier, uh, by policy. Um, if you haven't got a good uh, foundation, you, know, you go down to the shrine of remembrance, there are four million bricks in the foundations of the shrine. It's been there since 1934. Um, so, and it's going to be there for a lot longer. You think of the foundation that builds your council, especially being financially sustainable, sustainable and having a good set of policies, council policies, and then uh, the, the governance policies that back that up. Yeah, um, just a couple of things. I think um, I come back again to the fact that there's so much that we do. We do everything. Um, in our councils. The, the governance is, is broad. It's not only the Local Government Act, it's 
you know, there are acts around the environment and a whole range of others that we, we have to be uh, looking to when we undertake our work. I think it was helpful, and this happened right across the, the country, that we did a, a review of our financial sustainability and then looked at uh, developing long-term financial plans. We've now moved to asset and infrastructure plans. I think we're, we're sort of trying to knock off the biggest things, and I think um, our performance around those now is much clearer. We've got much better evidence and, and good data. I think it's about, again, prioritising what are the things uh, that we want to look measure across the whole sector and then what might be the things that are unique to us because we're local and we don't all do the same things. So I think there needs to be still some, not saying we don't have those measures, but I think it's about prioritisation, again coming back to the fact that we don't all have the same capacity and I think we need some guidance from the other levels of government about what the priorities are in conversation um, with us. I just want to raise one issue, I guess it's you know, something to put out there. We're talking about the fact that we've become much more professionalised, we've got very well educated young people coming through the ranks of CEOs um, who have very much corporatised the way local government or it's moving um, into to that more corporate approach. I guess the next thing is, so what do we do with our elected members who represent people off the street? Now, other boards that I sit on are skill-based boards. So how far can you go as a corporate entity when you in the leadership are working with very professionalised, highly skilled people and you've got people who are interested in their community, who wander in and say they're happy to come along a couple of times a week uh, to, to, to contribute the strategic direction of your organisation? I mean, if you're asking an outsider to look in on that, they'd say, well, that's, that seems quite, quite a bizarre notion. So I think if we're thinking about where we're going in the future, maybe, and I think the next session is going to look at this, how much do we professionalise the decision makers you know, who come onto local government? Do we move to a more professionalised body and have a participatory model whereby you have professionalised people sitting with the administration doing strategic policy underpinned by local parish boards or whatever you want to call them who are the general public, us, me, who are out there who are interested in my community and want to feed that in to people who've got skills and expertise in a number of areas who can then work in combination with the administration. Will that then see us more able to really nail performance management? Is that, the is that where we want to go?